Welcome to the uh, Caller Lab session on uh, sussing out the floor. Uh, this is, um, state the date, it says. What is the date today? <laughs> I've been here forever. It's the 6th. It's the 6th. Today's April the 6th, and this is the sussing out the floor session. Uh, my name is Barry Clasper. I'm the, uh, the moderator, and uh, to my left I have two able panelists, uh, Deborah Carroll Jones and our surprise mystery panelist who wasn't on the... Uh, on the list, on the announcement that we sent out, uh, Mike Jacobs. Uh, the first thing I need to explain is where this title came from. Um, the word sussing, which means to investigate or discover, uh, is used relatively commonly in Canada and Great Britain, wouldn't you say so? Um, so if you just said that to somebody on the street, uh, there, they would know what you meant. It's not like it's an everyday word, but everybody knows what it means. But here in the U.S., it seems to have dropped out of your vocabulary, so for you it sounds really bizarre, um, which makes a title that gets a lot of people into the room, we thought, which is why we went with that. And this um, this idea came out of a chance remark that I happened to make to a fellow who edits a newsletter called the GCA Call Sheet, and he there's samples outside on the table. It's excellent publication, by the way, uh, whether you remember that organization or not. There's lots of good information in there. Um, he's always looking for uh, topics and authors to, to write things. And I happened to mention to him on an escalator one day that I'd had this experience at, at Caller Lab, probably the first Caller Lab I'd ever gone to, where I was eavesdropping in the bar and a bunch of callers that were talking about this notion that that when they start a dance, particularly with a new group that they don't know, they do things to kind of test out the floor and try and understand what that group of people is going to do that night. Um, so it's a way of find, discovering what the dancers who are in front of you right now are in the mood to do. And uh, they all agreed that they did something. You know, sure, we do that stuff. But... They weren't really sure how they did it. Nobody could articulate, here's the method that I use, here are the steps that I take, here's the tests that I apply. Um, so this percolated around in my mind for a little while and wound up with this chance remark to, to Alan on the uh, on the escalator. And he said, that would make a great series. I'm going to get a bunch of callers to write up articles and stuff, and you're the first. So, <laughs> so what you see in my handout is basically a very slightly abridged version of my article. Um, and... Basically, everything I'm going to say is in there, so I'm going to keep my remarks relatively brief and let uh, Deborah and Mike do uh, most of the talking. Um, but that's where it came from. Deborah also wrote one of those articles, which is why I commandeered her to uh, participate on the panel with me. And uh, Mike is the type of caller who calls in front of all kinds of, of uh, groups, travels all over the country and the world, so he's very experienced, obviously, in doing this sussing or investigation kind of activity to discover what the group in front of you is going to do tonight. So with that, I'll turn it over to Deborah first, and uh, I'll leave this on so that your mic still works. I have a bit of a cold, so I'm, I'm using my mic so that I don't infect the other panel members <laughs> with my germs. Thank you so much for that. Um, is this one, which one are we in? We're in two. In two? Okay, how about if we turn it up just a little bit? sounds a little bit fuzzy to me. Two, three, four. Um, is that a little bit better? Okay. Um, this is the first time hearing it from Barry's lips to God's ears that I knew how to pronounce the word. When I sent him my handout, I wrote it as shushing. <laughs> shushing the floor. And I knew what it meant, but I didn't know how to spell it or how to pronounce it. So uh, Barry very tactfully wrote me back and said, well, this is how it's spelled. And I had made every effort to find a definition. I had looked in my Webster's. I had looked in John's Funk and Wagnall. And it wasn't in there. And so he sent me a link to an online dictionary, and I found it. But now I will say it correctly. Sussing. Sussing. Okay, sussing. Um, I've been calling now for 27 years. When I first started calling, I had three goals. Number one was that I wanted to be accepted as a good caller, not a good female caller. I wanted to try to transcend that gender. Secondly, I wanted the ability to read a floor. 
And I wanted to be able to do that before the end of the first tip. Because where I learned to call, we didn't have club callers. So every night was a crapshoot. Every dance you had, even if you recognized the people, you, you really didn't know what you were walking into. Unlike club where you have your own folks, you're the club caller, and you kind of know, even though there are variations and differences depending upon the night and their mood and the moon and different things like that. And my third goal was to have fun. And uh, number two was the one that I was really concerned about. So I've worked very hard on that. And uh, am I going to have to separate you two? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'm teasing some friends of mine out there from Oklahoma. So this was a goal of mine that I set out early. And I don't know whether or not you've ever thought about it or made it a goal of yours, but I would encourage you to do so. And you may know your group very well. I had the same group of folks every Tuesday night. Eventually, I did have a little club of my own. But it could be different. Some nights they came in and they were brilliant. And I couldn't give them enough. And they were more and more. And they wanted and they could just do everything from anywhere. Yeah, harder. And I'd come back the next week. And they had all left their brains in their glove compartments of their car or something. Because there was nothing there. And yet you, I still have to keep them. I still don't want them to go home. I have to try to figure out something to do for two hours. So you do have to apply this skill whether you're running around all over the world like Mike Jacobs or whether you have your group that you work with on a very steady basis. So when Barry asked me to do this panel, I had to kind of step back and say, now how, how have I learned to go about that? And for me, sussing or being able to read a floor is not just choreographical. It's also emotional. I have, to, I have to be able to connect emotionally to those folks that are on the floor. So I wrote down a few things of how to go about doing that. Some of it happens before the dance. And I like to get there so I can see the faces of people coming in. Are they coming in like they've got the weight of the world on their shoulders? Or are they coming in with a happy face and a certain level of expectation? I'm watching for their facial expressions. I'm also watching for the attitude and the facial expressions of the people that are sitting at the table, taking their money. Um, do they have a smile on their face? Are they welcoming the people as they come in? Because I kind of feel like the sponsoring group can really make or break the attitude uh, of that dance. So I'm watching for those folks as well. Sometimes clubs will have greeters at the door. Um, I don't know if with some clubs it's an assigned position or if it's a volunteer position. Sometimes I feel like they're at the door because they drew the short straw, you know, and they have to be there and welcome the people, and it's just not something that they're real comfortable with. Other people, they love it. They make you feel like you've known them all your life and, and you're, you're coming home for Sunday supper. So I watch for that as well because that's going to determine sometimes how I'm going to try to approach this crowd. Um, I like to also, a uh, number three there, I said circulate and greet. And that means to greet your sponsoring club as well. Those are the people that are signing your check for that night. So you want to make a special effort of saying hi to them. I always hug the table people because they're stuck there for sometimes two-thirds of the dance. They would like to be appreciated. And by the way, wasn't that a fantastic little presentation that Ed Foote did today? Amazing. He was talking about that, a word of kindness, a little, I recognize you're here and I'm so glad you're here and thank you for working the table. Oh, they just, you know, perk right up. My goodness, somebody's going to come around the table and hug me? How cool is that? So uh, I'm watching for that too. That kind of perks up their attitude. And if their attitude is perked up, they're going to share that with people that are coming in the door. It's just sort of a cyclical, spirally thing. Now, sometimes in our area... Uh, in, in the, the North Texas area, they will have free rounds, and other times they have a workshop before the dance starts. Depends on the group. If I have a workshop, that kind of gives me the choreographic um, information that I need to, to sort of know where I'm going to go for some of the rest of the night. Not necessarily the emotional. Other times I walk in and there's no workshop, it's pre-rounds. 
Well, how can I make that work for me? How can I use that to help read the floor? The workshop, um, those people I've already won over by the time the dance, hopefully if I'm doing my job right, I've already won them over by the time the dance starts. So I've already got those, those soldiers are already suited up and ready to go. It's the other folks I have to kind of bring into the fold. If it's round dancing, I don't really have an opportunity to touch the round dancers, if you know what I mean. They're on the floor participating in their, in their program. But I'm still watching them. I'm going to need them later on in the evening. And the way I'm going to need them is that usually people who are out there for pre-rounds are dancing a, a little higher level of round dancing than the score dance rounds that are done in between the tips. They did not come in out of the studio audience of Dancing with the Stars. 99.9999999% of those folks are square dancers that have been dancing long enough that they have also invested time in round dancing. Usually they're very good dancers, very good square dancers because they've had that experience. So I want to imprint their faces and the colors that they're wearing in my brain. So when I get up there to start calling choreography, I can count on them to do what it is I'm asking them to do. So that's how I'm kind of reading things before the dance ever starts. When I was first learning to call, I was fortunate enough to get an experienced caller to come to my house to help me a couple of times. And I got a square of people together that I had... Um, bribed with food. I told them we would have a barbecue if they would come over and dance a little bit with me. And so uh, I knew them all and we're all ready to go. And and uh, my my friend Dave, he says, go ahead and start. I said, okay. Bow to the partner, corner two. And he flipped up the needle. And he said, what do you know about that square? And I was, I, I had no idea what to say. I didn't know anything basically. And he said, take a look at what you have out there. So I looked, and I said, I still, I don't know what I have. I don't know. And he said, that couple over there, couple number four, they're holding hands like uh, like white knuckle. They are so fully gripped together. Those are people that are a little bit insecure. They're clutching partners saying, please, God, let me come back to that person. <laughs> don't let me get lost. And he said, um, there's two other couples there that automatically joined hands to circle left. Now, what does that tell you? They're pre-programmed. Their caller always calls circle left at the beginning. If I don't follow bow to the corner two and call circle left, I'm in trouble. If I call four ladies chain, they've already stepped into motion. So I have to be able to use that for my goal, which is I want them to listen to me, but I don't want to jerk the rug out from under them. So these were little clues that I hadn't even started calling yet, really. No choreography yet, but I already had information about that square. Um, I like to say something over the microphone, turn to your corner and say, yada, yada. Usually you have someone who comes up and says, this is the great Mike Jacobs who can leap tall buildings at a single bound, and they build you all up, and the dancers are all standing there, and they hand you the mic, and you're like, Oh, my God. <laughs> Here's all these people. What am I going to do? So I always usually say, turn to your corner and say, and I try to come up with something that they might find amusing. Um, when when I was doing the shushing, the shushing thing, there was a comedian on TV that said, asked his audience when they were out there, turn to the person next to you and shush their hair. Now, now you know that you were kind of supposed to rough us up. Turn to your corner and shush their hair. Now, they may not touch each other, but they will laugh because they can just picture putting their hands in some stranger's hair. Yeah, or don't you touch my hair. So if they don't have hair, you know, I turn to your corner and buff their skull. I, you know, I, or turn to your corner and say, have you ever seen me dance? That always gets a giggle. Anything like that because I'm looking for smiles. I, I think it was a television show one time or where they were saying they, they challenged the people that were in the studio audience for the next day to go out and smile at everyone they saw. But not like, not like that. Not like you like, yeah, you're having a, you're a, a jack o' lantern or you're, yeah, you have a stomach problem. But to really smile and mean it when you looked at people. And so I did that. 
and I happen to be kind of in a public place, like going to the airport or whatever, and I'm smiling, making eye contact with people, and people are just grinning back at me like nobody's business. And what they said is we tend to mimic that which we see. If you're around people that are all scowly, you have a tendency even subconsciously to mimic it. So I have to make sure that I'm smiling. I have to be up there and I have to put that smile on my face because if you guys close your eyes, everybody close your eyes, and I want you to tell me if I'm smiling when I'm talking to you right now. No. You could hear it, huh? Okay, now close your eyes. Am I smiling right now? You can hear it in the voice. So even if the square is paying attention to what they're doing in their in their square, they can hear that you're smiling. If I'm smiling and it comes across in my voice is telling them I'm having a good time. If I'm having a good time, hopefully they're also going to have a good time. So I do a lot of smiling like that. Yes, did you want to? Actually, one, two. There's, th- there's been a study. There's actually a chemical released when you smile that if you actually fake it you know, and put that on there, that there's actually a chemical release of different glands and so forth that force a general feeling of good and relaxation and so forth. That yeah. that it that even if you fake it, <laughs> that it still is is excreted. And so faking it can actually put you into the mood even if you don't feel it. I did not I did not realize that I had science to back up my <laughs> I appreciate that. That's wonderful. Thank you. Now that I've I've kind of seen if they're pre-programmed and hopefully everybody's smiling and they've heard my voice a little bit, now I start to call. The, The first several sequences that I'm going to do are, number one, modular and memorized. And I'm watching for other things. I'm I'm kind of going like this back and forth because I want to make sure that I'm what I'm seeing as far as timing. If I call star through, does it look like a ripple drill where this square's hands go up and then this one's go up and then the, or do they all go up and come down at the same time? I'm watching to see how tuned in they are. Um, I try to have very forward flowing, easy to accomplish, successful choreography. I want them to win. If they win, I win. And if I win, I get hired back because they enjoyed themselves. So I'm looking for easy choreography, and I'm kind of scanning the, the floor. I'm not focusing on one particular square at all. I'm just looking to see how it's flowing out there. I'm also watching for hand positioning. If I have lines of four facing and I call f- forward and back, I'm especially concentrating on the center two dancers of the line. Are they connected? If they're not, I'm going to have some problems down the line with centers and ends because they don't know where they are. They're not connected. Um, If I call a particular call, slide through. Are they passing through and, and looking both ways to see who they're supposed to face, or do they know immediately which way they're supposed to go? Dancer positioning in the square is very important. So I'm looking for that as well. Um, I also want to know how they're going to react to a resolution. If I call Alaman left, are they like, or do they really do the hand turn? Is there a whoop because they made it successfully through the little choreographic puzzle? And if that's not there, I want to try to build that. Because they have a certain level of responsibility for their own fun as well. And I want to try to unlock that door and let some of that enthusiasm out. So I'm looking for that. I'm looking for the short promenaders. And... Um, And if they do that, if they are short promenaders, how can I accommodate those folks? Well, I can engineer my choreography to where the promenade starts 180 degrees from their home position. So there really isn't a way for them to short it. Because even if you're three, if you're just one quarter up, sometimes they'll back up, won't they, the little dickens? (laughs) I also like to do resolve at homes. Okay? Because I realize they're not really into promenading, and that's all right. I want them to promenade some. But if I can get them at home, they're like, 
yeah, she saved us having to stagger around the square for six steps. That makes me look good in their eyes. So I'm also watching for that as well. Um, I'm also looking for the smiles. Are they smiling? Um, there was a call. You, you remember Nate Bliss? Yes. Okay. Uh, Nate was pretty, had a very wry, dry sense of humor. And he didn't smile much when he was dancing. He was an outstanding choreographer, and he came to a dance that I was calling, which made me a little bit nervous. You know, here's Nate Bliss out there. He was going through everything, and he was just dancing along. His face was all kind of crunched up. And I stopped the whole floor. Nate, Nate. And he looked at me. I said, are you having a good time? Yeah. Could you tell your face? (laughs) Oh, everybody laughed. He laughed, and... And he had a smile on his face and a wait. So what happened? Everybody's smiling. And Nate, I knew him well enough, knew I could pick on him a little bit, and I wasn't going to offend him. And again, I've got to try to keep the smile in my voice. Now, I do have certain tester calls that I throw out there to try to see how well they can accomplish them. That's the choreographical thing I'm looking for, the little extra knowledge of how well they can handle certain calls. At Mainstream, my favorite ones that I like to use are Scoot Back. Of course, I can pretty much count that the boys will know how to do it when they're facing in and the girls are facing out. The girls will know where to go. How comfortable are they when the girls are going in and the boys are going to have to do the the, uh, fold? How comfortable are they when a boy and a girl have to work together? Um, If they're really just chugging right along with this, how comfortable are they doing it if I isolate the centers in a left-handed wave? They still have a right-handed box, so it's that familiar right turn. If they can do that, well, hmm, what about if I'm in a right-handed two-faced line with the girls in the middle? I have just the girls scoot back. How do they do with that? What do they do if I ask the girl to take the boy with them? How do they handle that? If they're really, really just chugging right along, I can go left-handed. Try that sort of a thing. Or I can put them in a quarter tag and call scoot back. That's the, that's the crowning jewel that to see what if they're really able to handle it. So I have those. Now, sometimes I never, very rarely do I, unless I've got them for a workshop, do I ever get to get to that quarter tag scoop bag. But I've got it in my repertoire to see how far I can go and what's comfortable. I want to shoot for between 80 and 90% success. I'd love to have 100%. It just doesn't happen. Sometimes you get a certain group of people together and the chemistry is bad. It's toxic. And you you scatter those people around, they could dance beautifully, but coming together, it's a nasty mix. And um, I can't gear the entire tip for them. I have to try for that middle of the road. I love split circulate. I love to use split circulates uh, from standard waves where you have the girls in the middle, boys on the end, because it puts the same gender together. That's a good test. My first one, of course, would be from from an eight chain through couples touch a quarter split circulate that they're comfortable with. Boys are going across. What about if the girls have to go across? How are they handling that? So that's a, another favorite call of mine. I'm sure you have some of yours that you use for your little programming purposes. Dixie style to a wave to me is has kind of separates the men from the boys. If they do it like it's nothing, I, I've got a pretty good good group for the evening but if the man courtesy turns the girl and has no idea he's supposed to end up in the middle of a left-handed wave i got a little bit of work ahead of me for that evening i'll probably be able to get them through it after a couple of tips of, of using it working it helping them a little bit but that that's a big indicator right there how comfortable they are with dixie style tag the line and half tag is a big one they can tag the line if you pass through tag the line no problem Can they pass through and tag the line, out, bend the line, and tag the line? Woo! If they can do that, we are smoking, man. We are off and running. (laughs) But there may be a little bit of scrambling on that. Now, I don't want to lose the whole floor if I decide i got to throw that little pearl out there and see what happens. I'm kind of casting my bread on the water. So I want to keep them close to partner and corner so I can get them back. Very quickly, I can pick them up. If, they, if they're scrambling and running and grabbing and snatching and carrying on, I can do a quick Alaman left, one or two calls away, and pick everybody back up, give everybody a chance to succeed. 
Um, and I also like to see how they do with clover leaf. That has to do with positioning. Are they aware? It's, to me, it's difficult when you're on the floor to know where a clover leaf is. I can picture it from looking up and down at a, a freeway intersection or a four leaf clover or that sort of a thing. But when you're on the floor, I think it's tough to see for the dancers. So I like to use that for them to let me know how comfortable they are with that single clover leaf as well as double clover leaf. And by that, I mean, for example, hedge pass through and clover leaf. That to me is a single. Everyone double pass through and clover leaf. That's a, that's a double one. That's what I'm talking about. Leaders and trailers. Are they smiling? And am I smiling? Am I keeping the smile on my face? My father, when he learned to square dance, he was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Bless his little heart. But he loved it. He had a good time. Daddy liked it when he, when he always had the girl on the right hand side. He liked it when he wasn't too far away from corner. When I put him with another man, he wasn't all that comfortable. And the way I knew that, was my father had one of the most beautiful smiles you ever saw in your life. And when he was dancing, that smile was just huge. And when I would start to get more complicated, that smile would just begin to melt away. And that was my indicator when Daddy was in the hall and dancing. I watched for the smile. So if the smiles are melting, that means they're concentrating. I'm getting a little bit hard. I don't want to stay there for too long. And the PLUS program, which I call Mainstream and PLUS m mostly, I'm looking for spin chain the gears, not exchange. I'm just looking for spin chain the gears because that tells me how often they've danced it. Are they pre-programmed? If they take off like bulls out of a chute for an exchange, I got a problem. I got to rein them back in, see what I can do with them. Also flip the diamond. If you're flipping left-handed diamonds or if you're asking the boys to be the ones who flip into the center. Maybe you use that a lot, but the group that I've just walked into on a Thursday night, their caller's never done it. So I've got to ease them into it if I want them to succeed. Another call that is an indicator for me is follow your neighbor. And follow your neighbor without spread. And follow your neighbor with somebody besides only the original males going in. Can they do it if it's a boy and a girl? Can they do it with just the girls? How far can I go? Can they do it left-handed? Chase Wright. And, and I like to use uh, Chase Wright from a completed double pass through. Center four, Chase Wright, the other boy run right. Can they compute that? Do I get the column when I'm done? And not all of this is going into the first tip. All right. I'm sprinkling these out as we go. Um, is that your first tip, Bubba? God help us all. No wonder they don't let you out of Oklahoma. <laughs> peel off is also another one. Do they peel off and go shopping? Or do they peel off and know exactly where they're supposed to be? Sometimes they'll peel off and bend. And you just want them to peel off. They're not familiar with their ending stopping spot. That tells me I have work to do for that evening if I want to use that. Now, in between the tips, down towards the bottom of my little handout that I gave you, again, I said circulate and greet. Pick out the specific people that maybe you've seen struggling a little bit through that tip and go over and give them a, a little pat on the back. Hey, you know, you did pretty good on that. I thought you were, that corner was going to get away from you, but you pulled them back. And they grin and, you know, just a little positive comment that you can give those folks so they feel good about themselves. I also like to go to those that were really good and say, thank you. Please dance in the front of the hall the rest of the night. And they laugh and oh, you know, they feel all good about themselves. And that's what I'm looking for, a smile on their face. Um, also be available and receptive to verbal feedback from your floor. And you see I wrote a few quotes down there. Can you do such and such a song? Always save room in your program for requests. And that's part of reading a floor. I want to give them what they came for. And if they came to hear me do ghost chickens for the eight millionth time, by golly, I'm going to try and work ghost chickens into the program for that particular night. Uh, we can't hear in the back. Be receptive for that. Tell them don't dance back there then. Get up here in the front. <laughs> Whatever you have to do. Hey, just let me know. I'll fix it next tip. Okay. Um, you're too loud. People can't hear in the back. They can't hear. People in the front, it's too loud. Tell them to change places with each other. <laughs> They'll all be happy. <laughs> 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 
meet in the middle, you'll be fine. Or where's John or, or whatever, whatever the questions are. Be receptive to those because people are trying to tell you what they want. And that's what your job is, is to be there and give them what they came for. But it's really a skill to read that. So you have to see the question inside the question or the question beyond the question. Sometimes they just want a little bit of attention. And if you say, I tell you what, you get back there and I'm going to look at you for the sound. And then, and maybe you look at their name badge and, and see who they are. So you say, oh, uh, uh, Mary, is the sound okay? They've given the okay. Whether you've touched anything on this system or not, you have now gotten their permission and they're okay. They're going to be in your corner the whole way. Um, the little note I put down there on the bottom that sussing is an, is ongoing, I'm doing that actually every tip. Yes, I want to have a fairly accurate read on what they're, what I can give them before the first tip is over, but you have to fine tune all night. Sometimes after the break, if your club breaks and they have this big, huge meal, you got a whole nother ball game now. You have to get them fired up again. You have to get them up and on the floor and get them to move and all that sort of stuff. Um, if they have, if it's the the Sunday morning of a festival weekend or a long weekend, they're tired. They're mentally and physically fatigued, and it's not going to be the same as it was when you read that floor on Friday night. It's, a, it's totally different. I put a little quote in there because I love to, to the words that other people put together, and I thought you might appreciate. Mike Ditka, his little quote, their success isn't permanent and failure isn't fatal. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Mike Jacobs. Thank you. One, one, two. I'm uh, glad that you used some of the same examples that I'm going to use here in the choreo. Um, it's, it's interesting that we all develop different key parameters that we think help us evaluate the floor to determine what we feel they can do. And it's interesting how many times we cross over the same path. What's, uh, what I've chosen here is a choreographic approach towards evaluating the floor. All of these calls are mainstream. And yet, if, if the floor passed all these tests, I don't have to test out the plus calls. If they can do these, they can do the plus calls. And, and it's interesting that, that if you watch a good mainstream floor, the plus is no real challenge to them. It is their ability to handle what are the basics of our programs and, and show skill at doing them that tell you then what they can do. Can I get a square? I know we're going to have them all leaping up at once, but. <laughs> Now, I have always been of the opinion that callers are really fairly good dancers. And the bad reputation that we get is because we're busy evaluating the other person's material. And, and that distraction usually takes away our capabilities here. The, the, the first category of things that I, I tend to evaluate is, is just simple name recognition. Head square through four. That's not the call. Square through four. No, 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 no. Boy, they, they're feeling guilty already. Everybody touch one quarter. Scoot back, and the first call that I test is simply boys fold. Now, you'll notice they execute it well. What I notice on the general floor population is people that simply do not know the call at all. They have no name recognition of it whatsoever, which says to me that there are ten other calls they won't be able to do the rest of the evening either. If the caller hasn't taken enough time to use or teach boys fold, then we know that they're not going to know how to always circulate. We know they won't do Dixie style do away. We know they won't do pass to the center. And I could go through the whole litany of the ones they will never do. And suddenly my call vocabulary drops from 68 to 45 or so. And even then I'm living dangerously. Um, girls pass through. Star through. Boys trade. Bend the line. Slide through. And pass to the center. And that's another call that 
We, now, we had a hesitation out here as we went out for the partner trade, but we went ahead and did it. But what do we normally see when there are people that don't know the call, they're standing out here doing the Statue of Liberty play, waiting to do something, and they're facing the wrong way, of course, to be able to finish. So, yeah, well, and they'll turn around only from curiosity, not because they have a dance sense, okay? They're purely turning around to see what was behind them. Centers turn through. Now, these are fairly good dancers, and so, but I know in my heart that they're not going to execute turn through like that unless they're in a circle figure. And so if they do execute turn through, then suddenly I know that I've got a more than fair middling chance of doing different things with the four. Centers split the outside two, go round one and make lines. Good. Star through. Centers pass through. And everybody spin the top. Now, the place, the testing place that I normally put turn through in to use it someplace other than a circle is here because I've maximized their success. The turn through is going to make them look normal on the outside facing out. They have no chance to grab anybody else unless they're from another square. So there's no temptation to go on and do something different, and I've got a good odds on chance of seeing success. Everybody turn through. And, of course, they are. But I've got to be able to see that, that name recognition of the calls. And that's a whole category of calls that, that we don't see that, uh, the name recognition of. Bend the line, pass through, wheel and deal. Yeah, you all are going to nail all these, so you're going to make it look good. Zoom. That is the hardest call on the mainstream list. Why? Because it's a total non sequitur. The action bears no resemblance to what the call does. Now, we teach other calls, and they have clues in their names, and that becomes the base by which dancers learn the calls. Zoom doesn't have that advantage at all. I remember John telling me, you know, years ago, that the general idea was that we dropped substitute, which was the good name, and, and put it in Zoom, which was the good action. And what we really wanted was to end up substitute being the Zoom action. And we would have had our ideal world. Unfortunately, now we have substitute on the C1 list for no good reason. And we have Zoom here, which is really hard to learn. It's actually overseas, it's easier for them to learn Zoom since they are in a word learning situation as opposed to on American floors who have the advantage of all these other calls telling them what they do. You know, split two, go round one, and make a line is a whole night of English in Germany, whereas on an American floor, it's an easy teach. Zoom becomes impossible. John, you had to come. Well, the main thing about it is, yeah. I'm sorry, Mike. That's okay. Okay. The, the situation with substitute is in the United States and probably Canada, too, and most English-speaking countries People know what substitute means. It means swap one for another. And I've called it on the floor without teaching it to brand new dancers, and they'll get to where they're supposed to be. They may not do it right, but they will change. Yeah, I mean, here was an ideal name that actually was a descriptive action, and yet we found that we had to end up putting Zoom here, and the dance action was good, but... It was a wonderful, it was an awful descriptive word. And so name recognition is one of the issues in evaluating a floor. Um, setters pass through, slide through. And these are all great dancers because they are touching the hands in the line of four. And that's one of the, that's the second element, which is position awareness. They're aware that they're in a line of four now. They can easily recognize centers and ends. They can easily recognize where the center of the line is, bend the line. And see, so they're able to execute, wheel and deal. I thought we'd push the envelope a little. <laughs> but holding hands in the line is the only way they're going to be able to figure out how to do the call. And so I know when I recognize dancers who are not even holding their partner's hand that they're not going to be able to, able to execute any of the calls fairly well as well as holding my hands out throughout the whole line. Um, everybody California twirl. I caught you. You almost. They, at the last minute, turned to the proper handhold. But I always tell where I'm in in a square by the fact that when I'm in the bell's position, I got my palm down. 
and when I'm in the bow position, I've got the palm up. So I can easily recognize what space they're in. They change. Go back where you were on that handhold. Yeah. You were down like this, and that's the easiest place to be as far as when you're done with the call, but it's the wrong combo for the position. You're supposed to be man palms up, girls palm down. And so that's another factor in the handedness, making yourself aware of where you are within the call. Everybody in centers pass through, and everybody box a net. Now, our styling book says you're still holding right hands. Okay? So... So you have to be aware of where you need to be at, at a position in time. Also, that you've rotated the hands in all the cases so that you're in the proper space to be able to execute the next call. Everybody in this square, when I call box the net, don't rotate the hands. Box the net, please. Now, this has got to be the most uncomfortable position in the world to be in, and Watching a floor that doesn't rotate the hand tells me afterwards they can't square through, they can't do a right and left through, they can't even execute a pull by. <laughs> oh, yes, it's horrible, isn't it? Yeah, go ahead and, and don't hurt yourselves anymore. <laughs> but, but it's the correct execution of call, that's my next category, of watching how to evaluate a floor. Everybody's starring through. Do a right and left through and do a Dixie style to a wave. And you will notice, I wish y'all would screw up. I, you know, I, you notice that all of the guys slid over to their right as the girl chained across so that the last dance action of Dixie style to a wave was a left touch a quarter. Okay? Um, all the girls run around the guys. Girls trade. Everybody bend the line. Do a right and left through. Fellas, don't slide over on the call. Do a Dixie style to a wave. And this is what we typically see is the girl having to fling the fella into the middle in order to get the left-hand wave executed. And many times since there's such a weight differential between the guy and the girl that that action that the girl's forced to do to fling him into the middle results in overturning so that we don't end up with the left-hand wave. We end up looking at the corners of the room. And that's another factor going back to position awareness is as long as we're dancing in square calls that you might as well always be oriented to a wall on any call. We don't use anything in any level I know of before below C4 uh, uh, where an eighth, sorry Don, where an eighth of a turn is is part of what's going on. Don wrote Tilt the Wave years ago, <laughs> which was long before its time. <laughs> and um, the, the action of not facing a wall should tell them that they're wrong. And, and people that are aware of where they are with the walls end up being with the dance wall. Yes, ma'am. What about wheel around when promenade don't stop? I, I'm getting there. But <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, um, the wall situation is really how you can help yourself to be a better dancer. And, and actually, the, the way this is really brought home to me was years ago, we had a festival at the Biltmore in Phoenix, which was built by Frank Lloyd Wright. And most of the, the, the dances were in regular convention-type rooms, but three of them were in rooms built by Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright. One was a ten-sided wall, hall. No, the best one was the, they had the plus hall in a room that had five sides, none of them parallel or equal. So as a result, after the first promenade, they had nowhere idea where to go to get back home because there was no way to sort where you were from where you originally started. And so it, 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 and, and even the stage in the room was at an angle. So it was no help whatsoever. And so it, it's saying, <laughs> and, and so, but that brought the idea home that, uh, you know, that we should be able to use the walls in the room as a benefit for our dancers. And particularly in the course of teaching, we really need to utilize this. Um, everybody um, eh, left swing through. Good. Do a U-turn back, and we convert it to the right-hand wave. Spin chain through. And we had a little bit of turning, <laughs> which I was hoping for more of. But, you know, 
So obviously, you know, it, we don't call spin chain through in and of itself all the time, you know, because it, it's it's just simply not used. We normally circulate the girls around the outside to use the magic model converter, but there's so many other things we can do, and and particularly spin chain through and of itself is a wonderful get out. Boys run around the girls, bend the line, pass the ocean. Let's assume, since I didn't check corners and stuff before I went, that the people that are facing in are on the other side of the square from where their corner is. That, in other words, if they did a step through in a trade buy, they'd see corner for an element left. Okay? So that would mean that this person here is this person's partner. Spin chain through, everyone. And I got a wonderful get out for a right and left grand. Right there. So there's other ways to utilize the call in all kinds of ways. And you'll notice that I didn't do it from any strange formation or anything else. And yet I made it choreographically useful other than the two circulates around the outside to get people resolved. Um, boys run around the girls. Bend the line. Dance flow is also particularly important. If everybody do a right and left three and send the ladies Dixie style to a wave, Good. Boys trade. Now, I'm going to call recycle and veer right. That should flow very well one into the other. And the execution of the recycle normalizes the setup. I've set up all the positive factors for them to be successful. Recycle and veer right. And yet I know that what I see on the floor will be fighting me on all of it because the boy's doing an unfamiliar action. I'll see them fighting me because they're going in an unfamiliar direction. And if they don't normally touch hands afterwards, I normally will have a two-faced line situation that will be very iffy if it's really a two-faced line. Sometimes it's three or four faces. And, and that's simply because there is a refusal to touch hands, drop the hands, guys, and all the couples circulate, and you'll notice that as they don't touch hands, they start getting out of kilter with the walls and everything else. And so many times I'll force the issue with another center's trade, boys' trade. So these are all factors on which or how I evaluate a floor. That's name recognition, position awareness, dance flow, execution, and everybody bend the line. There's one other thing is that if I add additional cues, can I increase their success? Do a right and left through. Send the ladies Dixie style to a wave. Starts with the right, swing through. And chain down the line. It's a great dance flow module. It's also just two ladies chain as far as the actual modular equivalent goes. And yet, by the addition of simply that pre-cue of boys start swing through or start with the right swing through, I've got plenty of time to pre-cue it in so it doesn't interfere with their dancing if they know the call. But if they don't, I lead to their dance for success. Now, if I find they can respond to a cue, then it means I'm in like Finland as far as being able to get them through a successful evening of dancing. You notice that we also did lots of position work, hardly did anything sashayed, and yet we covered what I used to call most of the ten neglected calls of mainstream. That when we get through that, that I know that if they do that, chances are they can dance the plus less with no problem. And so that's my evaluation. So, thank you, Square. Oh, and on, wait a second, real quick. On the wheel around, you know, not just for promenades, which is another factor, um, but everybody passed through, wheel and deal, and the center's wheel around. There's the dance floor for the action. There's a way to then verify things for the people on the floor. Veer to the left, California twirl, boys trade, everybody wheel around, and chain down the line. Now, what she was referring to, everybody pass through in wheel and deal. Double pass through. First couple go left. Next couple go left. All promenade. Head man of the girl you got wheel around. Now, they were good. They squared to the walls. But more often than not, we see dancers try to repeat Custer's last stand and dance caddy wampus, and they end up being very unsuccessful. 
And it's those kind of parameters that I know whether I've got a floor that can dance well to the rest of the list or that's going to have trouble with it throughout the evening. Thank you all. Thank you, Mike and uh, Deborah. Um, as I said, most of what I uh, had planned to say is in the article and uh, written out at some length, so I'm not going to just regurgitate all that here for you. Um, but I just wanted to kind of summarize some of the, the um, common themes that I, I think we've heard. Um, one is uh, when Deborah and I sort of uh, passed notes back and forth about what this session was going to be, um, we got a little frightened because we were both thinking exactly the same thing. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and I was, I was thinking, wow, I'm thinking like Deborah Carol Jones. I was pretty <laughs> impressed with myself. <laughs> and actually, Mike and I didn't confer beforehand, and yet a lot of the stuff that he did was also, you know, directly along the lines that I thought, which is starting to make me wonder if maybe we don't really have a methodology here that's kind of, it's sort of a, an underground methodology that we're not aware of. Maybe we should write it down to get it out in a book somewhere. But, this business of evaluating a floor, assessing out a floor, starts before the dance. Uh, one of the things that I do that uh, that neither Deborah or Mike mentioned was I'll try and get to the dance and set up early enough that I can have music playing through the system before they um, before the dance actually starts. So as the dancers are coming in the hall, they're hearing music. Uh, that's something that's a lot easier to do now that we've got digital music on on computers and mini discs and whatnot. You don't have to lug around a you know big box of LPs or something to make this happen. Um, and I found that that really affects the mood of the dance. Typically what I put on is music that is danceable, but not necessarily square dance music. So it may be, you know, 60s rock or something like that, that depending on the vintage of the people that are there, you put on something that you think they're going to recognize and they're going to enjoy. Um, and if you see things like couples getting up and two-stepping to the music or something like that, which I've had happen a lot, like you know that already the mood of the dance is is going to be good. Um, every once in a while it can backfire on you though I, I was at a, at a convention where I got there early and I, I was opening the hall so I put on some, some music it just happened to be as we were reaching the, the top of the hour when I was supposed to start calling that what came on was a Dixieland version of Sweet Georgia Brown and there was this little funny looking guy at the, at the front of the hall and it was a really big hall and everybody was sort of around the outside and nobody was paying much attention and he started doing this dance, this sweet Georgia Brown started kind of jitterbugging, and, and I mean, it was the wildest thing you ever saw, and this guy was good, and a crowd started to gather around this guy, <laughs> and I'm supposed to get up and call, and there's this big crowd watching this guy dance, but the worst of it was, I had to follow him when the music stopped, <laughs> And it turned out he was actually, he used to be a Broadway dancer. He was a professional dancer. And uh, he'd retired some time ago, but he still had the chops to do that jitterbug, I'll tell you. But if you, right away, even before the dance, you can be evaluating the kind of mood that people are in. And a lot of the testing and whatnot that Mike and Deborah have talked about happens very subconsciously. You're just evaluating how people are reacting to your voice, how they're reacting to, their, to your music. Are they paying attention? Are they listening? Or are they distracted? Um, you know, are you getting the hand holds and the, and the crisp kind of, of um, dance execution that you're going to need to be able to do a little more complicated choreography? Or are you going to have to, you know, basically go with the fuzzy kind of choreography where the direction they're facing maybe isn't so important and uh, they're going to be able to succeed without knowing exactly where they are in a two-by-eight matrix and that sort of thing? Um, it's uh, it, it's a, a judgment thing, and and one of the things that I've learned as I've been working more with new callers and, and doing some caller coaching is how often we say, well, it's a matter of judgment. <laughs> you know, you kind of have to look at it and make up your mind: is it this or is it that? And unfortunately, the only way to to arrive at a state of being able to exercise good judgment is through the prior exercise of a lot of bad judgment. Um, so you really just have to get out there and, and kind of watch what people are doing. And I think the way I picked up a lot of the stuff that I just do unconsciously is by watching what other callers are, do. You know, really pay attention when you're dancing that first tip or two to, you know, a caller who's, who's, uh, whose style you really admire. And just ask yourself, what is he doing? 
and what would I do with this floor? You know, if you, if you watch the, the um, caliber of execution around you and you realize this floor is kind of flaky and there's, you know, there's lots of stuff that I really wouldn't want to attempt with them because it's just going to fly apart, what does the caller do with that? And how does, how does he keep them dancing and keep them entertained even though, you know, he may be having to adjust his, his choreography to do that? I wanted to leave a little time. We've still got theoretically five minutes, but since it's the last session of the day, we've probably got a little more uh, for questions and uh, comments, and feel free. Mike Lady is coming to the front. The Mike Lady. Boy, everybody wants to get to the bar. I'm Peggy from the middle of Kansas, and uh, our weather is uh, changeable very rapidly, and I've noticed uh, you can start a dance, and uh, during the middle of the dance, a front can move in. Have you picked up on this, the barometric pressure just changing drastically in the middle, and you, you try to get keep the people going? Wow. Uh, I mean, that is something that I've noticed a lot. Um, some of the groups I work with regularly are getting on in years, and I mean, you can tell right away when somebody comes in and they don't have their meds quite right. Um, and, and and you can also, I've, I've really noticed that as the people, I, the, you know, the general population that I call to regularly, as they're getting older, their stamina, and I don't mean their physical stamina, their mental stamina is decreasing. So they'll dance great the first tip two tips, three tips. By the time you're getting towards the middle of the evening, stuff that you could do in the first tip, they're actually starting to struggle with because they're they're starting to, to grow a little weary and their ability to just snapshot on what's going on in the square and where the lines are and where they are in the, in the formation, it's becoming harder work for them. So they're starting to fail at it a little more often and they get a little, you know, a little ragged in their execution. I, I don't think you can ignore environmental factors. At the same time, it, sometimes it becomes too easy of an excuse to not perform up to snuff. Um, particularly in, in the course of lessons, I've seen us always make evaluations, well, they're not really ready to learn tonight or this, and we make excuses to not teach, and we end up, that's where we start to fall behind in the teaching process. I've always printed a schedule of what I was going to teach and stick to that. Now, it may differ on how much I explored or to what depths I get into in a particular call, but I always find that if I stay to that schedule, that the learning process ends up being very even. Plus, you always got the factor of if you had teach too much on one night, you got to review all that the next week. And so staying at an even keel, no matter how great they seem one night and bad they seem the next time, that you tend to be able to proceed on towards your goals of learning a particular program. My question, I'm Lynn Webster from the Twin Cities, is sussing when to end a tip. Do you have any tips on that? You know, some callers, you get them out there, and they're calling, and you're going like, oh, when is he going to end this tip? Is there any way you can assess the floor to when to end a tip? You turned me off. <laughs> I use a timer. <laughs> but I know what you're saying. Like sometimes you're thinking this tip is just going on too long. You know, you've gotten a bad mix of, of dancers on the floor. Like maybe all the dancers that are struggling with whatever's going on wound up in the same square. You got a square that's standing. You're watching everybody else dance. And, uh, I'll, again, I'll watch for the standard of execution that's, that's going on. Are they starting to fade on me? Um, I'll, I'll watch for disparity on the floor. Is do I have one or two squares that are just getting nothing, and they're standing there watching everybody else, and their faces are getting grimmer and grimmer and grimmer? Um, if I see that, then I'll cut the short the tip short. Uh, if everybody's just flying, I might you know extend it a little bit because typically I tend to be having a good time and everything's just flying, and it's you know you don't want to end that prematurely. So I hand it the back. May I comment? Oh. Sure. I'm here too. You're here too. <laughs> you just turn around and look surprised to, believe I to, missed see that. Me, to see me sitting there. Sorry. Yeah, no, you turned me up. Um, I had read a, a, a letter to the editor, I believe, that came into American Square Dance um, maybe 
two and a half years ago. And the person was saying that um, they've seen callers who who have called, you know, they've been asking a long time. They've seen callers who call long tips and callers that call short tips. And they began to, to must have been some sort of an engineer, because they began to gather stats on, on what was going on in the hall and how many people stayed and what the general attitude was. And what this dancer was asking the callers to consider very seriously is keeping their patter <coughs> portion of their tip short. Now, we used to say one time through the record. That's a little hard to do when everything's going digital. We don't have that visual uh, checks and balances to see. But they said maybe four minutes to five minutes of patter and then stop. Because if you carry it on too long, the people are tired by 9 o'clock and they're going to go home or they're going to go down to the coffee shop or the pizza parlor or whatever it is. They appreciated very much the callers who kept the tips short. It seemed to keep the energy level and the enthusiasm up higher. So I'm just giving that out there for your consideration. Now, I use, you know, the original phrase was call once and a half through the hash record, but that was when the sets and order records were five minutes long. One and a half through the records was seven minutes, 30 seconds. Most singing calls now and patter records are all three minutes and 40 seconds. And so twice through the record gives you the same distance that what we did with the old sets and order records. Excuse me. I usually stay in that content of if I'm calling a pattern and singer, then my pattern is seven minutes and, and thirty seconds or so. When I go, uh, when I do nothing but a hash tip, it's ten minutes long. But I absolutely end at the end of ten minutes. And so basically, there's ten minutes of dancing in each quadrant, and it doesn't matter whether I'm doing a mainstream dance or doing a C3 dance. Don Don has a question. Just before he he makes his. His remark, I just wanted to introduce Don Beck at the back of the room, for those of you who don't know him. Um, he's the author of a fantastic book on mental image calling called Out of Sight, which is unfortunately out of print now, but I've, I've heard he's hoping he can he can maybe get something online for us. But uh, the other reason I'm uh, pointing him out to you is uh, in my handout, you'll see a link to his to an article on his website that Don wrote many years ago, and uh, I found out talking to him at breakfast that uh, he actually wrote that article for the same magazine that Deborah and I wrote our articles for, but under a different editor many years ago. So uh, this this is not a new thought we had, apparently. But Don wrote this article called Non-Destructive Testing, um, and it's, it's really interesting because it gives you ways that you can um, do the kinds of tests that, that Mike and Deborah have been talking about in a way that doesn't take the square down if they fail the test. Uh, and that hence the term non-destructive testing, which is an engineering term, meaning you stress something to the point where it's almost going to go, but, you know, you, you uh, don't actually kill it. Um, so that's an, an interesting technique, and I, uh, I suggest you go and have a look at that article. Now you can ask your question, Don. Actually, I just wanted to know whether you wanted me to put in my three cents worth or not. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, first of all, Barry has the... Um, address to my website or to that section of it. Um, you can abbreviate it. It's a long, hairy thing just by going to donbeck.org um, and then clicking on articles and then going to non-destructive dancing, uh, testing. When, at, when I started calling, people told me you'd, you'd check out the floor and how well they did. You know, a common sequence was head square through, square through with the outside too. Um, bend the line, square through, trade by, and you keep you saw how far they went until they broke down, and then you knew about how good they were. But as Deborah said at the beginning of her talk, you don't want people to fail at the beginning. You want them to be able to dance. You want them to be convinced in their mind that they can dance to you, and because that way they're going to be more secure and feel better about themselves and feel better about you and hire you back and all that stuff. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the things that Deborah was talking about are destructive testing, and some that Mike were too. Um, you know, pushing the scoot back till eventually maybe you got to the quarter tag, which you don't get to too often because you've broken them down before. I've found over the years some ways, and, and the article say, tells about them, but I will tell one in particular that I still use a lot and, and may help you and give you an example of what I'm talking about. They're win-win situations. You get them out whether they accomplish what you want or whether they don't. 
Um, the most common thing that I like to use is, is from a normal two-face line. Head square through four, swing through, men run. Couples circulate, bend the line, blah, 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 blah. I can see without stop and go calling, but I can see where they're going to end after that couple circulate. If they're pretty sharp dancers, they're going to have a two-phase line. If they have a little bit weakness to them, they're going to have a two-phase two -phase line with a gap between the centers for a fifth person. If they're even weaker dancers than that, the couple's going across. They're going to have T-bones. The couple going across will bend the line before you tell them to. But you're going to tell them to bend the line in the right and left through anyway, but you can see how precisely they call that without breaking them down. And that way you get a feel for how well they know the calls, how well they know, as Mike said, formation awarenesses, which is a big thing. And there's several other examples in there, like in the article like that, that is a win-win situation, that are win-win situations. They're going to get out of it whether, whether they do it correctly or not. But by your watching them, you can suss out the floor as to how good they're doing. One, two. Okay. Betsy Gotta here. And going back to the talking about the length of tips and digital, I am not a technical person. When I first went a little bit digital, I went on a mini disc player, which I could loop if I could play, press the buttons in a series after I started calling. I do not have enough brain cells left to do that. So... My accommodation was to record the music onto the mini disc to the length of the time I wanted the patter to be. Most of my patters for mainstream and, and plus, where I'm going to do a patter and a singing call, run between five and I have a seven minute or so, but there are a lot, a lot of six, five, five and three quarter minutes. And then when I add the singing call, I come up with a ten minute tip that Mike was talking about. When I call advanced or challenge and I am not doing a singing call, I have 10 to 11 minute. Now, I can't always end with the music and get them back home. But I know that once I push the button to bring that, start that piece of music over, I resolve and bow to the partner. And that was my accommodation. I think that what happens is the people who can loop on their computers or their mini disc or whatever electronic devices they have, because they can loop, they haven't got a clue as to how long the tip has gone on. And they forget. Brett, Brett Kaplanman, Renton, Washington. I was going to make a comment. Mike had talked about the styling with box and out and things. The other thing that you can do is you can actually look at your floor and tell what level of dancers you have just based on handholds alone. You know, with hands down, probably advanced and challenged dancers. Palms up, probably newer mainstream dancers. Interlocking thumbs where you're actually arm wrestling with somebody. They've probably been dancing while they haven't taught the proper way to, to grip that hand. Another thing to look at is like on a courtesy turn. If the lady's putting her hand behind her back, she's probably been dancing quite a while. And I, obviously, I would hope that we don't teach that because for styling, it's, you know, it's very hard. Some guys actually grab the arm and hurt the ladies. So just those simple observations of where the hands are, you can, you can make a really quick observation. Same thing with left, left hand up, left hand down, depending on, you know, have they been trained recently or have they been dancing a long time? A lot of men aren't comfortable putting their left hand, their left palm down. Um, you used to, even me in this square that we did, I kind of wanted to see, okay, I guess we're doing left hand palm down, right hand palm up. So just those simple types of things you can kind of evaluate. And the other thing is, as you look at that square, you may have a mix of kind of a little bit of everything. So it's kind of a potluck and you just kind of got to figure out where you're going to go. Well, we're well over time. I, I thank you for uh, attending this session. It's, no, I thought it was 5.15. No? Well, it's, oh, we're not over time. Well, you've got to stay here for another five minutes then. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Betsy has another question. Okay. It's another comment, which is Don was talking about, um, I don't have the exact words, but no, testing without cre creating failure, non-destructive testing. Thank you. One of the things you also can develop when you're sussing the floor is a way to make sure that you can create the success if they start to fail or if they fail. 
develop a way, if they've gotten themselves slightly abnormal, to normalize them without them knowing what you did. And that is another way to, to be able to suss the floor and then not create the failure. Keeping them close to partner and corner so that the resolution is quick is is really a key. I'm Deborah back again. <laughs> and um, um, I, I appreciate Don's concern and his comments very much. The more that people are unsuccessful, the more we can end up driving them out the door. And sussing a floor doesn't doesn't mean that we take them un- until they're broken and bleeding. It means that we have these little litmus tests along the way to see. And sometimes, just like Barry said, we've overdone it. We pushed it too hard and we crashed and burned. And it's always pilot error. Whoever has the microphone has all the power. And it's pilot error. If that square went down, it's because you did something wrong. Even if your choreography was technically perfect, if they couldn't do it, you let them down. So uh, I appreciate that kinder, gentler attitude kind of coming out and, and that protectiveness of our dancers. We do have to be very, very aware of that. And believe me, if we could come up with some kind of a formula here at Caller Lab that we could bottle as caller judgment, we could all retire. We would all be absolute millionaires because everybody would be lined up for cases of it. Diana Wagner from Topeka, Kansas, only calling two years. I've danced much longer. Um, I'm noticing that the callers are working us during the patter and then putting Sadaga much patter in their singing calls. They've overworked us again. I'd rather enjoy the singing call. I, I really try to say nothing. Betsy got it again. One of the one of the things way back in the 60s that people used to do was they would workshop or use the call, the, the pattern that was going to be in the singing call during the patter. And one of the ways I suss out a floor for what I want to do in my singing call is to use, if I want a theme around a call, I use it in the patter. If that is not successful, then I'm changing that singing call figure and using something else. If it works, then I've already got them in tune with what I want to do for the singing call so then they can relax and enjoy that singing call. Don Beck, just to kill the last couple of minutes. The the handhold thing is a great example. Watching handholds and that stuff is a great example of non-destructive testing because you're watching, you're doing stuff, you're seeing what they're doing and how they behave without breaking them down. They'll leave it to themselves to break them down. Uh, one of the other examples that I use, um, and Mike was using fold, is how well they can use that. An example, a case of using that I like to use that, that is non-destructive dancing because they get out of it nicely is four ladies chain, four ladies chain back, four ladies fold, and, you know, maybe they will or maybe they'll turn to face each other or who knows what, star through and promenade. And um, even if they don't know how to star through, at least they will promenade and they'll, they'll get out of the other people's way. But, again, by watching how they handle the formation of that, is a good way for you to evaluate how much they know or how well they know it. Well, I think we're we're at time now. So I'd like to thank my fellow panelists, uh, Deborah Carroll Jones and Mike Jacobs, for joining me with this session. I hope you found it uh, useful and informative. And, and we uh, thank Barry for his <laughs> his leadership. Thank you, Barry. And it's time to hit the bar.